Well, welcome. Don't clap your hands yet. Let's see if we get through it. All right, so big data. Let me first give you an overview of what I, I've, where I come from. So I discovered informatics in the 90s, so it's a pretty long time ago. And uh, throughout my life, I became a system administrator in research labs, and I started to get interact with uh, user and data, and so, you know, Fast forward many years, I'm still in a research lab uh, since uh, 2012, and I became the de facto data manager of my lab. And um, the only thing that is important there is that I became a yoga teacher to, co to cope with the craziness of the, the life in, the, in my lab. So let's talk about my lab for a second, my lab. Lab of my boss, of course. So the Rehabilitation Neural Engineering Lab, well, it's a neurophysiology research. Be ready because we are going to talk about a lot of uh, uh, physiology signals and everything else. What did we do? We try to restore sensory and motor functions uh, w after nervous, uh, nervous system injury or limb loss. So that means people that do not have an arm and a leg or, or both. And uh, if you, you can see here, we had a subject that was uh, able to control the robotic arm that you see in the back, uh, just thinking about it. She was thinking about it, I want to move uh, in one way, and the robotic arm was doing it. After, I don't know how many years, she was able to feed herself uh, chocolate. That's where, where, um, her dream. So, um, Now, to give you some context, so in uh, able-bodied individuals, meaning people that have all four limbs, you have your um, nervous system, right? And you have uh, an arm or your leg. You think about moving, and magically it moves. This is what the motor functions are. And then you maybe pick up something, can be an egg, and uh, you feel it, you know it, because of the sensory function. So your brain is uh, processing a lot of variables, right? that some of them are their position, force, pressure, texture, there's a lot of them, and you don't even realize that, right? So what happened when you have a nervous system injury or a limb, or you, you're missing a limb? Well, you have the same, the same nervous system on one side, and you have a, a prosthetic arm, in this case, an expensive one, but the two functions that I just talked to you about, it, it's not, they're not that easy to implement. So you need what we call brain-computer interface. That's what we are working on. Not personally me, of course. I don't think I have the knowledge to do all that. I just deal with all the data. So the final goal is to be able to give these people the ability to pick up something and feel it, even if the arm is not the original one. We are in the lab. We are almost there, not quite, for production. Let's put it this way. So. Experiments, I know. Um, we have uh, our nervous system and we have sensors. That one that you see, it's a penetrating electrode. So that it sticks in through your skin or whatever tissue you know, we are, we are uh, working on. And uh, we measure the neural activity. We have a complicated system, which I still don't know to these days because it's uh, in the work of 20 and some people. And uh, it does uh, generate control signals that control the robotic arm. So you think about it, we see which area of your brain uh, you know, activates, and we know that you are, you are thinking about moving your arm in a specific direction. These arms uh, have uh, lots of sensors in them, so we can use them uh, to feed back in our experimental system and uh, inject uh, specific patterns, a uh, stimulation pattern in your nervous system, let's call it this way, and uh, you think that you're feeling something. So in there, that's where I come in. There we have this amount of data that is sparse throughout the lab. Uh, we have, like, I don't know, 10 computers to run one of the experiments. You, you have to collect all this data. They don't come to you. But on top of that, so what, which kind of data do we get? Well, we have um, the raw neural activity, intramuscular nerve activity, the control system, the, the system that we have has a lot of events, you name it. And uh, 
From the um, prosthetic arm, we have the contrast level, you have uh, the feedback, you have the position. On top of that, there are other stuff that we measure, so like the kinematics. So if you don't raise your hands if you don't know what kinematics means. It's fine. I was ignorant the same way. So basically, it's measuring your, the position of your body in space. So, and then we have video and images because we have to be able to go back later and say, okay, did we see this thing in the, in the signals? Is that actually, did you see something in the, in the subject? Then you have notes, and the best is the question mark signal. Your coworker or your boss comes in the day of the experiments and say, I saw this cool thing yesterday, can we do it today? And you're like, all right. So how do we cope with all this? So that's where my work in the last five years has been, together with a lot of other stuff in the, in the lab. So, let me quite clarify right away what in the scientific community, in our scientific community, means for data and metadata, because that can be really uh, confusing. So data, you measure, you have a temperature, temperature sensor, or a position sensor, or a pressure sensor. You get these lines, the squiggly lines, they are um, dots. You know, they are like, uh, at this time, I collected this, uh, this value. Well. Can you tell me what do they mean? No, right? The only thing that you can tell is that on the left side and here, maybe those four, num four digit numbers are years, but you don't know. So we need a lot more information that we can say, okay, this specific signal was measured in the forearm, your brain, or your toe, whatever it is, and you can give it to somebody else and they know exactly. And that's where the metadata comes in. So you have the sampling frequency, range settings, type of sensor, and uh, a lot of other. I'm not going to read all of them. And believe me, you change the, t the sensor type and your reading completely changes. So it's really important at the end that you know, even because if you share your data with somebody else, you might most likely get a question back, what is this? Why didn't you you know, define this, this uh, information in there. So, how do we manage this one? Well, use, a, you know, use raw data files. You have your server, you have your sets of uh, uh, folders on the, on the server, and you put, I don't know how many millions of files for each single experiment. Well, that works well if you have two people working, and they're working right now. A month from now, they already know, don't know where the single information is. So it makes it e harder to find inf this information. Believe me, I, said, um, I work interactively with a lot of uh, these um, researchers, and you sit down and say, can you show me what you're telling me? And they spend 10 minutes clicking through folders and files to find what they want to show you. So you know, when I start to work, I, I was like, well, can we do something to improve this? Because it's not possible, right? Now, in the age of big data, when you just write a, a select or something like that, that you get all this data back, we are a multi-million dollar or, you know, lab, research lab, and we are still going through files. Mm. So then the major ones is the proprietary formats. We use a lot of range of uh, uh, sens uh, sensor acquisition system, and each one of them has its own uh, proprietary format, and between, within the same format, you get different uh, um, versions that if you are not aware of it, the reading of your temperature goes from, I don't know, 30 Celsius to uh, 300 Celsius. And you're like, mm, you know, so, and this stuff you discover just talking to the, to the person who ran the, uh, the experiment. So these are things that are really important to be able to track. And uh, the best is, uh, these data on the server are off-limits for everybody, meaning you can read it, you cannot touch them. You cannot change them because they are super valuable. What do they do? They take from 100 gigs to 2 terabytes of data, they copy on their local computer, and they keep going, and they do their own analysis. The next person comes in and does the same. So you find yourself with tons of copy of the same files, which you don't know if they're you know, the same one or they change a little and uh, becomes an issue. And your boss comes and says, why do we spend so much money for this space? So second try, um, 
we develop, I, I didn't, a MATLAB database based on this toolbox that was developed for, by one of the PhD students. It was a great idea. And uh, basically, it's a file-based database where you have specific functions that you can call up all these objects, so you, you go a step away from the raw files. And uh, each object aggregates the data, and the metadata. So you don't have to go and look for these two things that pertain to the same information. Now we can do something like this. We say, I don't care where all this information comes from. It's good to have that reference, but what the best structure that we need to describe our data? So, you know, if we go ahead, we call it MDB just for short because we don't have that much time to go through the whole name, of course. And so what was the best? What were the good thing coming from this? Well, the user experience was way better. They didn't have to go and track down the file. They, you know, load up MATLAB because that's what they use and say, give me this, uh, the subject number three and they would get it. And then from there, they could they traverse uh, the, the structure. Interactive exploration, they can go in and check and load the data, metadata, and so forth. Raw data, they don't have to care about it. So if you come to the lab and you look at data from five years ago, they don't, they don't want to know which format you acquired this data. You just want to use the data, correct? The you can structure the data in the best, the best possible way for your quest. So one thing that I learned is that, yes, you start from the same files, but if I have to answer a question for my analysis, it's better to structure the data in one way. If I have to answer a different question, maybe the structure has to be different. So we are trying to address that. So what were the problems? Of course, you know, every, at the beginning, all the ideas looks great, then when you hit the reality, so did not scale well. So when it starts to grow, we start to have issues in different ways. Data, data and functionality, somebody started to think about it. Well, if I put the data together with the functionality, like easy one, how to plot it, because some of the, these data are complicated. They had specific way to plot it. Put them together, I don't have to go and search for the function. I just use the, you know, load the data and I have the functionality. Great idea in practice, they don't work. Corruption. A. Because of the, tight, the um, bundling of data and functionality, what happened is that when you had to update the functionality, you had to think about what was the impact on the data. And if, if the software engineer, me or whoever was working, had a bad day, well, the data became not accessible. And that, guess when that happens? When you have a deadline, you have a paper due in two days, right? So. Um, then the maintenance and the upgrades became really complicated because, you know, if you do it on one, ten objects, great. You know, usually we work with uh, anywhere from a thousand and up. It's hard to, to check all of them. And the flexibility, this was, this was the best. So if you had to add a specific data property, you had to go back in code, add it in code, update the, 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 uh, the production code, and then, uh, you know, assign the value. And that was like, Nightmare, especially if, if you are not the person who developed that. And uh, query, the best. I remember I sat down and I was looking at some code and I saw one, two, three, four, five indentation. There were four loops, one inside the other, to go through some of this information to pull out only a tenth or even less of the information that was contained in everything. So what did we do? Well. Me and my boss, we sat down and said, okay, let's do a brainstorm. What, 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 how can we move forward? So the first thing we say, okay, what are the things that we really like about the, new, the, the system that we have? Well, the hierarchical structure, you can structure your, your, your data the way you want it, relationship between objects, the data lazy loading. So most of the people in, um, in my lab and around other labs, they want to see the metadata first uh, to see if uh, the specific data is the one that they're looking for, and then they load the data. Some of these data are gigabit, so you know, if you load them constantly from the server, it takes time, right? So, and the pairing data metadata, what did we want was queries. I mean, talking about database query. Give me the sign data from this subject that matches this, you know, this specific condition. Uh, flexible, year, year, uh, year, flexible structure, sometimes the hierarchy doesn't come. Flexible data and metadata, minimal coding. I don't want to 
go encode only to put in a new object in my structure, right? I want to minimize it, even because some of our people that deal with data are not programmers. They don't want to program. They don't want to do it. So uh, if you have a bad day and you com your software, you know, the API, call it API, goes bad because you have, you know, it's not your day, you still want to access the data. So we completely separated the two. And then cross-platform, of course, you know, they work on Windows and MATLAB. The, it's good for uh, interactive um, work, but when you have to automate and do the same analysis over and over and over and over, it doesn't, doesn't uh, flow really well unless you pay the huge license that they, you know, to provide to get the sy their system. And then the data and code separation. So, the last thing, you know, I started to look around and there were a lot of concepts that comes from the big data, that's what I, I, the big data approach, that were really valuable to, you know, implement in our, in, in our uh, situation. So what we did is like, scratch everything, let's start from scratch. Let's start from something that, you know, we don't have and we go from a zero up. So, big data, right? The four Vs, variety, velocity, and volume, that now I checked before coming here while I was doing this presentation, now there are four. There is uh, the veracity. I don't know why they call it that way. I was a little skeptical about the name, but so. Let's uh, look how those ones apply to, you know, the, our situation in the lab. Stick with me, please. So volume, well, we have hundreds of, object, of uh, subjects each one of them has thousands of data recordings. Then we have millions of files and 50 terabytes of raw data. These are just the data coming from the experiment. So then there is all, everything else that is what has been generated. You're like, ah, 50 terabytes, it's nothing. Well, we are two people and we have multiple you know, uh, responsibility throughout the, the lab. So it's big enough for me. The variety. Well, we have still images and videos with different formats. The, we have time series, uh, loosely called uh, neural and kinematics, and you name it, with proprietary formats. We have the structured data, you know, configuration file, math files, you name it. There are, we have it. And most likely, by the time I go back to the to the to the office, uh, I will have some other new format that somebody came up because I woke up one morning and say, it "Would be nice to use that one." So. Type of data, format, and information collected. Think about this way. You have thousands of data recording. If you, you will think data recording has the same properties, right? No. You have a set of properties that are constant throughout the, all the data recordings, but then there are some of them that varies uh, in the way, you know, if they are there or not, and sometimes not even, they are not even coherent across the same experiment. So uh, what about velocity? Well, we have two velocities, let's, let's, I call it this way, two velocity. One is the experiment. When we are running the experiments, in a con is a continuous stream. So constant stream of messages with data, uh, with the signals and events, and they range from uh, like 20 milliseconds to 30 kilohertz, sometimes even 100 kilohertz. Uh, so, and we use this archaic, I think that's the best way to define it. Uh, messaging system that was developed by another lab, and they, you know, they adopted it, and now they are so ingrained into the code that, that it will take probably a year to actually change to something that is more efficient or better. So I kindly say, put it behind you, let them use them, don't say anything, focus on something else. My boss has not complained, so we're good. Uh, and then we have within lab. What I call the within lab, it, it's burst and batch. Basically, you have spikes of, uh, um, so the data gets acquired and then gets transferred to the, to the server, and then from the server gets analyzed. So you have uh, an activity that is like this one. So you have days where you have uh, lots of transfer or lot, lots of per, um, uh, CPU uh, usage, and sometimes you don't have anything. Veracity, well, we call it data validation. You will agree with me that validating this kind of data, it's pretty important. Uh, so if you see something like this, I will have questions, right? 
and I'm the one that probably has seen these graphs the most. So one is like, what are those labels? What's the unit of measurement? And then, what are, what, you know, what are those ones? Which, which sensor do I, did I use for this one? And you have to be able to go back and say, we use exactly this. A, because if, you know, if you ch something changes, you have to be able to s document it. And then if you publish a paper and something is wrong, you know, it's really bad to re you know, retract the paper. And then what is the difference between these two signals? So, do you know it? Well, unless maybe if I spend, if I've been working on this data, I can tell you, otherwise it would be really hard for me. And then, did we drop any data points? Would you, you, know, you agree that if we drop data points, the controlling loop of the, ro the robots maybe doesn't work as well? So why is all this important? Well, experimental reproducibility and uh, replicability, the consistency of the user experience, meaning the person who is using the robot, right? You, Think about it this way, if you make a mistake, you most likely, instead of grabbing the egg, it's going to slap you in the face. So these are the change stuff that happens. So, and then, optimal prosthetic control. So, this is what I call the Arniel addition. So, the curation, or better, continuous curation. So, if we have a piece of data, we need to be able to, you know, you already saw the metadata. That one, it's what we call curating. So you have a, a, a signal, you want to be able to say what it's coming from, how you measure it, the conditions, and whatever information, the metadata. Why is continuous? Because believe me, you will never stop getting new piece of information. So I spend, when I started to work at the lab, I spent a year sitting in, in an experiment just trying to understand what they were doing and writing down everything. And as soon as I would turn and then go and put it in a, in a database or some kind of format, somebody would come and say, I forgot to tell you this. So, you know, the need to continuously be able to uh, include additional information, descriptors, tagging, call it the way you want it, to this data is really important for us. Um, so we go, if these one are the tags, you start with few of them, and then you go to something like this. And that is really important for us to know it. Because think about this way, different analyses require different tags. So, and it's a process, a continuous process. Every time you go and load this data, you find something new. Or when you talk to your coworker. So uh, who are the players in this one? Researchers, data manager, people that you're sharing the data, they're coming back to you and say, oh, you forgot to include this one, can you give it to me? Right now, they send you an e the, you know, the person you're interacting with sends you an email, but then that knowledge is lost because it's not kept in the lab. And this is my pet peeve, it has to be flexible enough that you can be, you know, can be done manually, automated, and uh, can be come from any sources and platform independent. I don't care if you use Linux, Windows, Mac, you use MATLAB, you use Python, you use Java, or you use uh, whatever. I want the, that information to come in as much as I can to collect, because otherwise you're going to lose something. So, what are our big data? Well, there are the four Vs that we saw before, and the 2C, I call the 2C now. So we have volume, variety, velocity, validation, continuous curation. So, how did we solve this one at the current stage? Well, we came up with this name, not, not my doing, but we call it MDF. And it's just a framework, really thin layer API that gives you the, all these abilities. Still, you know, there is a lot to do, but... Um, and uh, the design requirement, unique ID. For each object, you have to be able to uniquely identify it because we create these objects from different machines. And then they go in a single repository, but you, know, you, you cannot be consistent, you, know, you, uh, you have to minimize the collision between this unique ID. Platform independence, lightweight, direct access to the underlying data, um, query functionality, and lazy loading, dynamic metadata and data properties. And the last one is we put only the metadata in a database. The data themselves were saved in MAT files, MATLAB uh, files. Don't ask why. There is a long story. If you want to know it, ask me the question at the end. It's a, a, another presentation on its own. Um, so, well, the first benefit, we actually started to query in the data, right? So, you know, I can say, give me uh, a 
an object of type trial that has a name block 30. And you get this representation. This was actually the researcher C. Or a subject. This is MATLAB, uh, by the way. So the other thing is, uh, well, we can visually validate our data. Now, one of the problems I started to see, one of the problems, one of the shortcomings is that if I create this complex structure, you have few objects, you can imagine how these objects are interconnected, right? If you start to go up 100, 600, 1,000, 10,000, you don't know what, what's going to happen. So I started to play around with representation, force directed graph. So I imported some of the data, this is what came out, right? Doesn't mean anything, but if you add the new data, the importance is that when you add new data and you get something like this, well, here, where there's the red box, you can start to sense maybe that there is a problem. Why is that crazy uh, links? The, by itself, it doesn't mean anything. And maybe it's totally valid, but at least you have kind of a red flag and say, hey, let's go and check it out, right? And this one, we are trying to work and get it up and running because uh, the size of the collections that we have are growing. And so the researchers are asking me, how can we be sure what we are looking for? And you know, if you don't have a database behind this, you have to open like millions of files, basically. So what are the applications? Sensory experiment. This is one of the experiments that we do. Hopefully, you're not squeamish. So the idea is that if you stimulate the roots of the ner nerves coming out from uh, your um, uh, spinal cord, you can kind of uh, uh, trick the person to feel stuff uh, that, that actually is not happening. And bear with me for a second. So we insert these leads, uh, they're called leads, uh, they're basically sensor or electrodes, call it the way you want it. Depends on which uh, um, realm you're working on, they're called in different ways. So here is the, an x-ray of a person. These uh, were actually slided on, the, on your um, uh, epidural space. And uh, what they do, they start to take all this and put them together and stimulate and do all this crazy uh, research. And then the subject say, oh, the last time that you stimulated, I feel something here. This one is actually uh, the feedback from one of the subjects. They have a tablet, they draw it on, uh, and they tell you, here where I feel it. So we put all this in a database, and here what you get. You can say, for this, for this electrode, did I get a response? Did I get something? And how does it look? And here you can say blue, nothing, yellow, this person felt something in this between index and, th and uh, your ring finger. One of the information I left out purposely until now is that this person, you know, this is the right hand, this person didn't have a, a right arm. So she was feeling sensation in her hand, but she didn't have a hand. And that's what, you know, we are working on. Uh, it was pretty interesting. It was, uh, uh, I think, 70-something uh, woman, and she baked us cake all the time, so we were happy to have it as, as a subject. So why was a good reason for us to adopt the MDF? Of course, efficient way to organize the data, flexibility, continuous curation, data usability, data usability. So if you have the data in a system like this and not saying that the MDF is the best, it's a, a start for us, you are giving a tool to the researcher to not duplicate the data, but you can, they can just use what it's there because it's so easy to, um, to access it that they don't have to go back, they don't feel compelled to go back to the, to the, to the file. So the queries and the separation between data, and, uh, data access and data usage. So how you use it, it's a problem of the researcher. What I care the most is giving you the tools that are easy to use and make it easier for you to access this data. So what's next? Of course, so, you know, more queries and bigger big data for us or you know, real big data, almost, it depends on what we are talking. And we are talking about millions of objects. So each of these collections have millions of objects. So let's move forward. This one is a, um, 
we have uh, a subject that has uh, a spinal cord injury, so he doesn't walk, he's, uh, he's paralyzed from the neck down, he just moves his arm and doesn't have feelings in his, uh, uh, in his hands, I think. So what they did, they, I'm glad that the person before me was talking about brains because here it is. We, the, the lab, did a study and found out that those locations that you see there where the location on the brain that works when you th he thinks about moving his arm and when he thinks about uh, uh, getting tickle or sensation from the fingers. So to make it easier, it's the, the blue squares are the arrays, we call them arrays. They are 100 microelectrodes for where uh, the motor functions are located, while the bottom ones are the sensory functions. Why it's important, the differences, because the area of the brain uh, works in different times. So how does the experiment works? Well, you have your brain and you have your robotic arm. So we measure what is thinking, more or less, you know, your, your, uh, the fighting rate of your neurons, uh, the brain cells. They do a decoding and we control the robotic arm. So you see actually the robotic arm moving. Then we measure the sensor from the robotic hands they do the, the inverse transformation and they stimulate and this, the person not only moves the, the arm but can touch it and can feel it. If you're interested, I have a, a video where they actually did a, a test on this one. So these are the waveform of uh, the current that is stimulated every time they stimulate. And it's, that's the complicated name that they gave it to it. Don't worry about it learning. It took me a while. So what's the stimulation stream? So we have uh, our uh, hands on one side and the brain on the other one. Well, we read uh, the, the, uh, the, the sensors, we encode it. We actually go, we have to go through uh, safety checks because there are uh, lots of limitation. What you can inject is a cur you know, current. You can fry the brain, basically. And then there is a stimulator that takes care of uh, stimulating the brain directly. So if we look on the timeline, you have the stimulator, stimulator pattern definition. Basically, you're telling to the stimulator, OK, these are the amplitude, these are how many time for, you know, I'm, we're going to do this. And then you say, OK, this one you apply to this electrode, and this other you apply to this other electrode. And then it tells you, OK, I'm stimulating, I'm stimulating, I'm stimulating. What's the end of it? It's that to be able to know where you're applying your stimulation, you have to know the whole sequence. This one is probably, let me think about it, this probably is like 10 seconds, I mean not even, of data. It's not real, but that's more or less how it goes. So this uh, researcher approached me with this question, it's like, well, if we stimu constantly stimulate on one electrode, does the performance degrade? Meaning, if I stimulate in the morning, and then I do all my experiments, and I do the same stimulation at the end of the, the day, does the person feel the same thing? And does the electrode um, perform the same way? The way she was doing was loading the first file, creating the first column in memory, loading the second file, creating the second you know, column, and keep going. After four days of this, she came to me and she's like, my machine keep, keeps crashing. And so I sat down with her and I discovered that basically not even if we buy the biggest server that you can, and you go on Amazon, you can actually address this issue. So what we need to do, we need to count all the single, exp the reason why I gave you that full speech is because we need to count all the single events for each channel to be able to say how much time, many times, how much charge you delivered on a single electrode. To give you perspective, this person has been implanted for three years, so we have more than 500 days of recording, under more than 150,000 files, and uh, the number of of events when we started, we didn't have a clue. So the solution, of course, was like, oh, we have this uh, great tool, more or less. And uh, we say, every time we stimulate, we create one object. And so then we can query. This is like how it looks like. And we can query by session, by file, by day, by time, uh, you name it. There is a lot of them. The problem was importing the data. 
So what I did, I say, instead of importing everything, let's import only what we need, right? Then the number of objects was like, ah, but from a first estimate, we're between 10 and 20 millions, and then the time, it's uh, six months. And I was like, eh, probably not, right? So back to the MDF, I luckily I started to you know, keep track of uh, these importing jobs, so the timing. And uh, remember that I say metadata in database and data in files, right? I was like, went back, I was like, ah, that doesn't cut it. That's where we were spending most of the time. So to cut the time, and file access, we put everything in the, in the database. The reason we did that is because the data that is associated with this specific object is really small. And one of the issues that, the reason why we did that specification at the beginning is that we didn't want to have to go crazy maintaining among, um, a database that would grow like so big that you have to start about, you know, think about cluster and everything else. So keep in mind, we are two people shop. So, Going back, we did the same thing for the filtering. Then the time, well, only two weeks. At the end, we ended up with 30, more than 30 million objects. So that's what, you know, just to give you an example, from week of frustration of this person that could not load all the data, in uh, 10 seconds, I had her answers right away. Yes, we had to do all this, but it worked out. That's where my boss started to change his mind. So how was the workflow? Well, you know this part. We, take, we took the files, we put them in, in the database, then we listed all these uh, data acquisition together, we put it together, and uh, we assign, we say, okay, we did a stimulation on which channel, on which parameters, and all that stuff. From there, we could count and we could do validation. There are certain um, design uh, constraints of the system and uh, experimental constraints that if we could use to say, yes, the numbers that we had, that we found, are you know, acceptable or not. Of course, there is some tolerance there. And then the best thing is that we could actually start to do some visualization of, you know, like overall visualization that can give you some uh, kind of idea of what's going on. So, what were the challenges? The number of objects, and so far, you know, we have made a step ahead. Of course, there is still a lot to do. The information, which kind of information you need to put in. And this one, it's only, as much as we documented, is you have to sit down with the person and talk to them. And most of the time, you don't get the information straight the first time. So, and then the saving, how it was done. This one is something that I discovered while I was doing a single import process. So you get one object at a time. Uh, you know, solved it. I had a database um, server, and I ran multiple uh, processes at the time. The validation is still unclear, and hardware, and of course, platform. I realized that if you use MATLAB to create this object, it takes you, I don't know, one second. If you do it in Python, it takes you 10 milliseconds. So, and not, I'm not saying that MATLAB is worse than Python in this case, and time-wise, yes. But sometimes, you, if you explore with different uh, platform, you get be better results. So you have to be open to do that. So just to give you an example, the hardware, we started with a virtual machine. Uh, everything was virtual and uh, mounted from somewhere else. And then we dedicated a server with SSDs and everything else. Now, the next step will be to go uh, distribute and in parallel, but we, we are not there with the infrastructure. Uh, and we should, would have access through the university uh, to a parallel uh, system, but transfer the data and set up the, 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 the job over there requires some knowledge that we, we didn't have the time to set it up. So what is the conclusion? Well, the big data approach was, uh, you know, was successful for us to manage our data, because now I don't, I don't have a problem. You want to use MATLAB, you want to use Python, you want to use Java. I give you the address of the database. You can pull it out and do whatever you need to do. So if you want to batch it, you can go. Um, we were able to manage the big data with the MDF with minimal changes, and the query capabilities are priceless because now these people can get their, I don't know, 100, 200 objects in a matter of seconds, actually less, instead of running through thousands of files. 
and the login is invaluable, priceless. That, those are, it took me a while to set it up, but then uh, afterwards, uh, I was like, thank God I did it. Um, what's the future? Well, scaling, more data, of course, is coming, because now they started to see how you can query the data. Of course, you get more questions. Can we do this? Can we do this? You know, can we query the data? Can we put the, query, the data in a database somehow and query and get something out that is, uh, you know, meaningful? And then uh, the version two, because we realized uh, that there were some limitation, like limitations, some, yeah, limitation for uh, we using MongoDB, limitation in putting these vectors of the, of data in in, uh, in MongoDB, and so we have trying to we are exploring other other solution. And then batch creation of uh, objects, and the final goal for the querying is to have uh, an SQL-like SQL language where you can actually say, give me this data property where you know, the metadata matches this condition, and maybe you have a condition on the data, because you know, initially we put everything, only the metadata, in the database because we thought that that's what they want to query. I mean, not I thought. I sat down with 20 people, and that's what they told me. Guess what? As soon as we put it in production and they started to query, they came back and said, can we query the data? And I was like, OK, job security. I know what to do next, right? But still, you know. That's, that's a totally different, another dimension to, to the, the setup. And uh, the automation, so we want to try to automate it, the, the validation especially, because that's where the numbers are so big that you cannot validate by, you know, by just looking at this information. And then uh, the best that I think would be a valuable investment is to do some quantitative analysis on the, of the logs, uh, because then you can say, if I run something and it runs slower, what is the problem? Or, or at least you are, you are aware of it. So, and with that, those are my boss and some of my coworkers. That's my email. Please uh, email me or stop me afterward if you have any question. And that's uh, the bottom is what we are forced to put because uh, that's where we get the, the money to do this stuff. All right. Thank you so much.